most often drug that you will see being used is digitizing, oxycycline, and it's usually 100 milligrams daily or twice a day for five days, depending on, it's usually daily. So the thing with oxycycline is if you don't take it with meals, it makes you feel nauseous. So you want to eat, not milk, before you take doxycycline, okay? It also causes esophageal irritation, so you want to drink a lot of water while you are taking it, and you want to stand up. You don't want to take doxycycline before you go to bed, because it will cause irritation. Okay. There's a whole list of adverse effects that you can read more about in your um, handbook on page 178 you'll notice that all the pages in your that these words come out of is um, at the bottom of the slide so you shouldn't have a problem to find you know more information than is on the slide there's a whole list of adverse effects for tetracyclines okay the most problematic is that it chelates with um, positively charged ions. So if you take it with antacids or if you take it with milk, then it will not be absorbed. Okay? Because it is broad spectrum antibiotics, it causes GI disturbances as well. Um, some of the uh, tetracyclines are more prone to causing vestibular dis disturbances. Okay, in the ears, and then many of your protein synthesis inhibitors also causes limited liver damage or hepatic toxicity. Not all, okay, but many of them also have that problem. The next um, class of protein synthesis inhibitors is the aminoglycosides, okay. So the aminoglycosides are a very, how can I say, a very toxic group of drugs. It is rarely used on its own, actually never. You will mainly see aminoglycosides being used with other um, antibiotics. So if you look at the list of names, in which situations have you seen aminoglycosides being taken by people? Chemomycin? Have any of you heard about chemomycin? What is it used to make? What? Streptomycin. Okay, streptomycin used for? Gastrectomycin was one of the first drugs they used to treat TB. It's not really used to treat TB anymore. Canamycin and amitacin used to be um, used for MDR TB treatment with other um, antimicrobacterials. Now there is a new um, regimen that they are using in the Western Cape for um, <coughs> NDR TV. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then probably you've seen maybe gentamicin for children with pneumonia. They usually combine it with... with with ampicillin or a type of penicillin. As I say, you will never really see aminoglycosides being used by its own. It will usually be used with a penicillin or in any of the TB treatment with some other medications. Okay. So, um, it is a protein synthesis inhibitor, chiefly binding to is ribosomal unit and it can also cause cell damage. So it is a um, bactericidal antibiotic. Um, many times it is a 
they don't like using it in TB treatment anymore because you have to inject someone every day and I mean there's a lot of complications with injecting someone for two years every day. You know, it's not nice. So that's the other reason why they're trying not to use it anymore. The other reason why they're also not using it anymore is because it has got a narrow therapeutic index. What does that mean? Yes, it means excellent. Yes, there is a very small difference between its therapeutic range and its toxic range. Okay. So it is actually the drug can become very toxic very quickly, especially in terms of nephrotoxicity. Okay, these drugs are cleared mainly by the kidney. <coughs> so if your patient already had a pre-existing kidney problem, the levels will probably be higher. In the drug levels will be higher, so there's a risk of having toxic levels because the drug isn't being excreted as fast as it would have been in a normal patient with normal renal function. Okay. So, um, side effects, as I already said, nephrotoxicity, which is a big one, autotoxicity, okay. So, unfortunately, with canamycin, if people have in the RT and they have to be on it for years, Patients lost their hearing, okay, it's just one of those side effects um, that can happen. So there are both vestibular and cochlear um, toxicity. The vestibular is without balance, okay. So there you might get dizziness, ataxia, which means you will make one person, okay. And nystagmus, which means the eyes are shivering. Okay, cochlear is usually high frequency deafness that happens. The other very rare and interesting um, side effect of aminoglycoside is your cerebral muscle paralysis that it might cause. Okay, because you need to put the inflow of calcium into the neuromuscular junction so your muscles cannot contract anymore. That's a rare but a serious one, okay? So when you are noticing your patient can't move anymore, that's a little bit serious. Okay. Any questions about amino glycosides that you've maybe seen in the hospital or in the clinics? Because of, its, because of its toxicity and because of 
widespread resistance. Chloramphenicol is a very nice drug if your patient is allergic to other medications. It's widely distributed. They use it as a substitute for meningitis treatment if people are allergic to um, penicillins. And also for rickettsia treatment with the other antibiotics is going to indicate. For example, your tetracyclines. Your tetracyclines would be your drug of choice if the patient has got zinc bite fever, which is equal to rickettsia disease. If your patient cannot take tetracyclines because maybe she's pregnant or she's allergic, then chloramphenicol is something else. However, if it is um, the trimester pregnancy, it might be a problem because chloramphenicol may cause gray baby syndrome in neonates. Okay? So we generally don't use it for very small babies because the neonates uh, liver is not um, developed yet and it cannot conjugate the drug to make it um, less toxic. Okay, so the metabolism of chloramphenicol is slower in, a, in small, very small children. Okay, so it might reach toxicity levels. Other problem is bone marrow depression. It can cause aplastic anemia especially in patients with that is already anemic or taking other drugs that causes anemia. And it is mostly used um, in eye drops. Okay? When you have a stein in your eyes, they will give you sulfacetamide ointment or chlorophenicol ointment. Okay. Then fusidic acid is one of those standalone drugs. Okay, it's not in the family. It's like vancomycin, that is a little orphan in the cell wall synthesis images. That is what fusidic acid is. Mainly for gram positive MRSA infections. What is MRSA stand for again? Something resistance. Penicillin <laughs> resistant. And more yet. Okay. So it's only used for severe infections, it's well absorbed, but it may cause a Clinizolid is the other drug. This is one of our last line antibiotics, or the last line antibiotics for gram positive infections. So we don't see clinizolid used often. One of the very weird Drug interactions that linozolids have is that it interacts with um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Okay, monoamine oxidase inhibitors is sometimes <coughs> in the treatment of depression. So that is a quite significant drug interaction. Linozolid gram positive resistant infections. If um, penetrates very well into soft tissue, okay? So for complicated skin and soft tissue infections, as I said, drug interactions with antidepressants and myelosuppression is the main antidepressant. That brings us to our new, or DNA, or nucleotide synthesis inhibitors. This is quite a small group, which is <coughs> and trimethoprin and cotramoxazole. Cotramoxazole, you've probably everybody seen cotramoxazole. Okay, um, and then the other cl big class is your quinolone antibiotics or your fluoroquinolones. For example, ciprofloxacin, all the floxacins. Analytic acid and pipimidic acid is also quinolone antibiotics. And then the new kid on the block, well, it's not a new one, but um, one that you will be seeing more and more as they, um, it's now in the primary health care guidelines for the treatment of UTIs is nitrofurin toin.
Okay, just a note the, for our topical antibiotics. Under our sulfonamides, we've got silver sulfadiazine that is often used in the treatment of burn wounds. So if you've ever been in the burn wound unit, you would have seen it used. Yes? And leg ulcers, yes. Okay, so sulfonamides and trimethoprim, old antibiotic sulfonamides was the first antibiotic ever that they used. Okay, so obviously it is broad spectrum. It's not used often anymore because it's quite toxic and people tend to have big um, hypersensitivity reactions towards it. Um, sorry? Did you want to mention anything? No, I don't have the page. Oh, 172 to 173. Okay. So, examples are dioxine and sulfamethoxazole. And sulfamethoxazole are usually combined with trimethoprim. And they all basically work in including folic acid synthesis. So, folic acid synthesis is part of synthesizing your DNA, okay, or the bacteria's DNA, so if that is stopped, the bacteria cannot multiply. So its use are limited by its toxicity, especially hypersensitivity reactions. Um, some of your older results and older reacts. Um, used to crystallize in the urine, so when someone is using sulfamethoxazole or something like that, then you have to counsel in that they have to drink a lot of water. Okay, it can also result in folate deficiency. Okay, so it can cause your megaloblastic anemia. And then in newborns, if you give it to newborns, it can cause. Um, something called chronicterus, okay, where there's a buildup of bilirubin in the brain and it can result in brain damage. So we don't really want to use sulfonamides in newborns. Okay, so pertramoxazole, most often used in, for prevention in your HIV positive patients with very low CD4 counts. So any HIV positive patient that has got a CD4 Count of less than 200 should be on cotramoxazole treatment for the prevention of PCP or pneumocystis, pneumonia, toxoplasmosis, and isosporobili, which causes chronic diarrhea in immunocompromised patients. Then, just a note on sulfasalazine. So, sulfasalazine is a it's a type of sulfonamide, it's in the class of sulfonamides, but it is used in ulcerative colitis, okay? Um, and then the side effects include hypersensitivity of GIT problems and photosensitivity. And contraindication gastric and vaginal ulcers. Sulfacetamide, usually used in bacterial conjunctivitis. Side effects is irritation and hypersensitivity is a contraindication. Then we come to your quinolone antibacterials. Okay, there has been lots of talk about your fluoroquinolones because of their toxicity these days. Um, and they basically inhibit uh, DNA synthesis by inhibiting DNA gyrase and hypoisomerase form. It's used in, in the 
Palmer, um, TV also, and he has got a drug interaction with the macrolides, remember, um, both of these drugs increases QT intervals in the ECG, okay, which can precipitate arrhythmias. So last year, beginning of this year, there was a warning sent out by the EPA, okay, where um, they would say certain patients are at an increased risk for aortic aneurysm, including elderly patients and those with the history of blood pressure, they also blood vessels, high blood pressure, and certain genetic conditions that involve blood vessel changes. And that's one of the main reasons why they have now changed the guidelines so that ciprofloxacin is not really our first line UTI treatment anymore. Okay, because ciprofloxacin is one of these ones and we really want to reserve the use. We don't want resistance and we also don't want the toxicity and side effects. So some of your normal fluoroquinolone adverse effects is GI, um, joint pain, uh, disturbed vision and CNS effects. So it has got quite a big effect on cartilage, okay? And it causes quite often a tendon rupture, okay? Where your Achilles tendon is broken, you know where it sits. So fluoroquinolones can cause that. Um, also one of the reasons that we don't use it in pregnant women and small children because it interferes with bone and cartilage formation. Um, similar to tetracyclines, it also accumulates agents. So you cannot take it with anti, um, antacids and um, like iron and those supplements. Also, caution in patients with the history of convulsive disorders. The last one that, or not the last one, but the, the one that is brief or uh, alternative, that you can use as an alternative for UTIs instead of ciprofloxacin is nitrofurin point. Okay? It also causes damage to the DNA through free radical production. Okay? Usually you need to take this with food and it's got some general side effects as well. That you can read through on page 182. The other antiparasitic that I just want to cover now. So metronidazole isn't classified as an antibiotic, it's actually an antiparasitic. But uh, metronidazole is very good um, at stopping your anaerobic bacteria. So those bacteria that does not need oxygen to live. Um, often like for example with dental infections, which is your mixed bacteria, you will combine your penicillin with metronidazole um, because metronidazole will cover for your anaerobes. <laughs> Have you seen it in dental infections? They usually give you amoxyl with metronidazole. Okay. Um, so mainly anaerobic infections, good bioavailability, widely distributed. Okay. Now, metronidazole also has quite a number of contraindications, which includes patients with epilepsy and other CNS diseases, hepatotoxicity, hematological disorders, avoiding the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, it's got a lot of drug interaction. So one of the main counseling points for metronidazole is that patients shouldn't use Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, alcohol. Okay, because you're going to get very, very sick. If you take, you can try to take metronidazole and take alcohol, you're going to feel really bad. Really bad. It's not one of those contraindications 
that is, you know, it might happen, it might not happen. It's definitely going to happen and you'll feel really bad. So that's so preferably you don't want to take alcohol with metronidazole until 48 hours after you have your last dose. So the side effects commonly is nausea, anorexia, headache, metallic taste in the mouth and other GI. And then your prescriber's points is to avoid alcohol and there might possibly be dark coloration of the urine. Okay. And that is that. We Microbial stewardship before? No. Okay. So I'm going to weave in the facts that you have to know about medicines into the context of antimicrobial stewardship because of um, antimicrobial resistance that is come, becoming such a big problem all over the world. There is now a push to really stewardship into our professional education. So just take like 30 seconds to read this case study and then you recommend an antibiotic for me for this patient. So it's an 86 year old male that was in hospital for heart surgery and then doctors discovered that is urine sample contained, contained Klebsiella, so he had a UTI or a probably a hospital acquired UTI. And then you can see they sent the urine to the lab and the lab sent you this report. <coughs> what can you see on this report? <coughs> It's resistant to everything. That is what we call a XDR. XDR. UTI. Okay. So there's nothing that we can be this Yes. Shame. Okay. That's a real case that happened in Tokyo. Imagine the hysteria under the healthcare workers when they realize there is nothing that we can do for this man. Okay, so that is the reason why the government is in a tent. Okay, and we really have to start looking at ways to uh, make the body resistance spread less. Okay, so. In that case, we need to know what causes antibiotic resistance, okay? Overprescribing is the first one. Patients not finishing their treatment. <coughs> Overuse of antibiotics in animals, okay? Did you know that the animal feed, that they feed animals, has got antibiotics in some of them to keep them healthy? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Poor infection control in hospitals. Do you know what infection control is? Yeah. Yes, good. Lack of hygiene and poor sanitation in general. And then a lack of new antibiotics. Uh, I think fusidic acid or lisagolid was the last antibiotic that was discovered. Which probably can't exactly remember, but I mean, there's not much new stuff coming out, so we have to look after what we have, okay? And there, I told you about that study that they did with GPs prescribing antibiotics for nothing, okay? 
and um, that is the spread of antimicrobial resistance. So you can see the resistance to punelone, <coughs> that very toxic one I spoke about, is increasing very badly. You can also see third generation cyclones or in resistance are increasing. Okay? And this one is a bad one. So this one is our last line drug. The polymixins is our last line. So if our last line isn't working anymore, <coughs> bad news. So what the government are doing in their antimicrobial resistance strategy is to say that there's a one health approach. So we don't only look at people because animals are also exposed to antibiotics. And the resistance that you get in animals and humans can, you know, get mixed up. So they talk about the One Health approach, which includes animals, fish, vegetation and crops. So the type of stuff that they spray on our vegetables, industrial and household chemicals, as well as humans. So it includes the whole range of society. So when you're looking at antimicrobial resistance, it's not just good enough to look at humans. You have to look at the whole society because antibiotics and disinfectants are used everywhere. Okay? So there is just an example of how animals, the antibiotics given to animals, their feet can be transmitted into humans. Okay, so that's why you can't just look at humans, you have to look at the whole picture. So, if we look at the strategic plan for antimicrobial resistance governance, governance there are three pillars that the government are looking at, and that is enhanced surveillance, antimicrobial stewardship, and prevention, including infection prevention and control, and vaccination. Okay, because vaccination is still the best way to, you know, not have any infection. <coughs> So if we're looking at surveillance, what is surveillance? We have to know what is our resistance pattern in South Africa. Because we need to know where is the resistance, what antibiotics is showing up in resistance patterns, how should we handle this, that, antimicrobial consumption, so we need to try and figure out what is the consumption of antimicrobials so that we can see where we can spare and decrease our consumption. We also need to make sure that the antimicrobial drugs that we do have, quality is good, so that they work the way that they should be working, and they're also medication errors or prescribing practices. We need to monitor how our prescribing practices or and if they are effective. So that is the surveillance document that came out in 2018, I think. Um, and they are monitoring for specific test pathogens, the Epsila, like we heard about the guy at Epsila in the eye. So um, the Epsila daughter that we are seeing one in um, blood cultures that they tested was resistant. For step four is one in three was resistant. For E. coli, one in four was resistant to third generation cyclic four. <coughs> for ceramonis, <coughs> one in four was um, resistant to carbapenems. Remember carbapenems? It's really our beautiful, lovely class of antibiotics that we want to keep. 
um, Abel Baumani, 8 in 10, resistant to carbon venoms. The, the thing about Abermani is that it, it is, it lives on hands. Okay, so hand washing can prevent that. And then your internal copy, 1 in 20 and 1 in 50. So that is the current surveillance that we have. And then if we just look at some of these um, bacteria, where they are found, so if we're looking at the Abermani, mm -hmm. which is 1810 resistant, it has got a relatively long survival time on human hands, which can lead to high rates of cross-contamination in nosocomial infections. So hand washing is <coughs> extremely important, especially for this one that has got such high rates of resistance. And read more about where they come from. So, according to the consumption data, South Africa has got quite an interesting mix of antibiotics used in humans and antibiotics used in animals. In South Africa, you can see most um, antibiotics are consumed by humans. This is usually the other way around in other countries, where in other countries, the animals will actually be consuming more antibiotics than the humans. So I don't know why our people are taking so many antibiotics. Okay. So if you look at the use of antibiotics, broad spectrum penicillins, like your carbamoxiclase. There's obviously trimethoprus and sulfamatoxazole, so that makes sense because you've got a very big HIVS body. Um, and then narrow spectrum penicillins is much less than broad spectrum penicillins, so that makes sense. Not really, because narrow spectrum penicillins is your first line ones, broad spectrum is your second line one. So what is happening? So the WHO has made an index or an aware index and they have divided the different types of antibiotics into the ones that should be used often, okay, that they should be accessed to all the time, which is your amoxicillin, amoxicillin and clavulanic acid, ampicillin, nitrofurin, toil, all of these ones. Then the ones to watch. So these are the types of antibiotics you don't want to see prescribed so often, which includes your antiseromonal penicillins, um, your carbapenems, third generation cephalosporins, your vancomycin, your macrolides, quinolones, those are the ones to watch. The antibiotics that we don't want to use, that is on the reserved list, is like your fourth generation cephalosporins, phosphomycin, <coughs> intravenous, venezolid, colistin. All of those are last line antibiotics. Okay, so the watch ones are also important because that is really second or third line antibiotics. Okay. So that is the AWARE index. Then we get to what can we do in hospitals. Most of your rotation is in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so this is from a document. It's a South African 2018 document, I think. Yes, guidelines for the prevention and con of antimicrobial resistance in South African hospitals. Okay. So there are two things. There are infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship. So because nurses are mainly involved with patient care, you are also the people that will take the lead in infection prevention. 
because you are on the ground. Also. So prevention of healthcare associated with infections and the spread of it to um, hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, standard precautions, environmental cleaning, decontamination, transaction based on precautions. Okay. And the other stream is our antibiotic stewardship or antimicrobial stewardship, which is the next thing that we'll have to look at. So, to enhance infection prevention and control, we need to prevent new infections. How do we do that? Through making sure that people's vaccinations are updated. Okay. Um, what type of vaccinations is important, especially for elderly and immunocompromised patients every year? Yes, the flu vaccine. Well done. Okay, so that's good. <laughs> um, water, sanitation and hygiene important. And then if there is resistant infections to prevent and control the spread of resistance microorganisms in human and health institutions, that is where the C. diff isolation comes in. Okay, so we need to rapidly identify and isolate patients with resistant organisms. There must be access to personal protective equipment and hand hygiene. Very important. I assume you all know or you've seen these posters in the hospital, the five moments of hand hygiene. So I'm not going to talk about it more. Okay. And then the summary of high hand hygiene methods. If there are visible things that you can see on your hands that it's dirty, you wash with soap to get the organic matter off. Okay. Then after you have done that, you can put on your antibacterial lotion. Because if your hands are visibly dirty, Many of the disinfectants are going to be activated by organic material. So it's always important if there is any visible stuff on your hands to wash it with soap and water before you, you know, put your. What do you call those things? You yeah. Yeah. Disinfectant. Okay. So that brings us to disinfectants and antiseptics, which is in your hand today. So disinfectants are chemicals that we use to disinfect instruments, floors, and walls. <coughs> Antiseptics are usually used on living material, okay? And it's topical. So some disinfectants are going to burn your hands if you use it, okay? So that's mainly the difference between a disinfectant and an antiseptic. So when you are disinfecting things, as I said, the visibly soiled equipment needs to be cleaned with salt and water before you disinfect them. Because disinfection means killing microorganisms on them. Microorganisms you cannot see. <coughs> Okay, because organic matter tends to deactivate many disinfectants and antiseptics. That's why you have to clean it with soap and water first. Disinfectants do not sterilize surgical equipment. Usually your surgical equipment, what do we use to sterilize them? Autoclave. Yes, we autoclave them. Okay. So the efficacy of a disinfectant will depend on the contact surface. So if you are putting equipment in there, it has to be immersed. It cannot stick out because the parts that are sticking out isn't going to be clean. The time of exposure. So you can't put it in for two seconds and take it out and then it's disinfected. It usually takes like an half an hour or two hours. So read on the 
thing is how long it needs to be in there. And then the other one is the concentration of the disinfectant. So usually you're going to dilute disinfectant with sterile water or something, or you're going to use it concentrated. So make sure you know what the concentration is of the disinfectant that you have to use. Do not store equipment in a disinfectant. Okay? Fresh solutions of disinfectant need to make, be made up every 24 hours. Okay? Bleach and hyperchlora are in disinfectants of choice for HIV and other pathogens. So JIC is very good. Um, and do not use disinfectants of skin because it's going to irritate. So here is the list of disinfectants that we're quickly going to go through. Alcohol, 70%. Very good. You get those alcohol swaps before you... Um, before you... Uh, injection. The next group is your phenols. Okay. Final, mouthwash, chlorodiazole, like metal. surgical scrubbing and to disinfect the skin. There's a shampoo. There's a 10% solution for cleaning skin and wounds. There's a 10% ointment for um, skin infections. And there's a 5% cream for burns and impetigo. When will you decide to use a cream or an ointment? It's except for what is available. If you have a choice now, what's the difference between a cream and an ointment? A cream is more fluid. Yes, it's easier to rub a cream in. An ointment is more fatty. Ointment is like Vaseline. Okay, it's difficult to rub in. Cream, easy to rub into the skin. Hey. Not necessarily, but I mean, if you now could choose. Well, it will depend on what your wound looks like, wouldn't it? Because can you rub? You know, it's like with the cream, you just you you can rub it. It's it's more like. And with the ointment, it's going to cover, it's going to leave a, a film over it, where with the cream, it's almost going to become invisible, so, yes. Okay. But you, I, I, I'm not sure if they will have these choices in Then we get the chlorinated solutions. For example, your sodium hypochlorite, your bleach, bleach like jig, uh, very good disinfectants, okay, but they can cause skin irritation. Hydrogen peroxide, not only for covering hair, but also a very good disinfectant, okay. You get your different strengths, 1.5 solution in water. And then a six percent solution for the removal of dead tissue and foreign material from wounds. You also get an eardrop hydrogen peroxide eardrop to remove skin wax, but it can cause skin irritation. Potassium permanganate or crystal violet. I don't know if you've seen it. It's very purple. Okay, very cheap. Very purple, very good. Okay, so you can use big solutions to clean 
pulses and Based practices 
um, that you can perform in these cases to prevent the hospital acquired infection. And there are bundles of care for central line associated bloodstream infections, catheter associated urinary tract infections, surgical site infections, peripheral line and ventilator associated pneumonia. So, do you felt the pleasure and go and read up about what is these bundles of care that you can do to prevent that people get these hospital acquired infections? So we'll take another five minute break before microbial stewardship. And it is being defined as an individual or a dis multidisciplinary systematic approach to optimizing the use of one or more antimicrobials to improve patient outcomes and limit the emergence of resistant pathogens while ensuring patient safety. Have you, have you um, been on any um, AMS ward rounds in your hospital? No. So if you have an AMS ward round, you can probably ask the system. It will be very interesting to go and walk around with all the people because there's usually a specialist, there's usually someone from the pharmacy, um, there's a microbiologist sometimes, and then they go around to patients and discuss antimicrobial treatment. And the, the, what you can learn from these ward rounds are very special. So it's usually one day in a week or one day in two weeks, depending on the hospital. So try and find out because I think you will learn a lot if you can, you know, just join one of these ward rounds. Okay. So antimicrobial stewardship works on many levels. So there's at the level of the hospital, which will have an AMS committee, okay? And they will discuss all the resistant infections and so on. Then you will have your AMS team, which is your healthcare workers, that will be going on these ward rounds. At the facility level, the type of interventions would then be to look at your local guidelines for antimicrobial prescribing, um, prescription authorization and audit, um, feedback, and then you have your patient level interventions that we will be looking at for the rest of the lecture, and then monitoring and evaluation. So those are the type of AMS stuff that will probably be in all of the hospitals where you go. Okay, so your multidisciplinary team is usually a team that operationalizes AMS and it will usually include a physician, a pharmacist, a nurse, the infection control practitioners and some other people. Okay, so there is a big role of the nurse in AMS in the hospital setting there you can have a look at that list okay triage and appropriate isolation um, accurate antimicrobial use and allergy history early and appropriate cultures so usually the nurse takes the cultures um, timely antimicrobial administration okay from when the antibiotic is prescribed until administration is very critical okay and to be able to make the time less is actually in favor of patient outcomes and there you need like a group of people to try and fix that because you need the prescriber it must be sent to the pharmacy the pharmacy must dispense it first and send it up so that you can administer it. So that's called hang times. And a lot of your AMS interventions that you can go and read about in hospital is to try and minimize the hang time, which means from the time that the antibiotic prescribed to the first dose that's actually given to the patient. If we can make that shorter, 
it improves patient outcomes usually. Medicine reconciliation, monitoring and reporting of progress, monitoring of adverse events, IV to oral switch. Why do you think it's important to switch them as soon as possible from an IV to an oral antibiotic? Or any medicine for that matter? Yes. Infection, yes, peripheral line infection. Okay, as soon as you can get that drip out, the sooner you can get the drip out, the better it is to prevent any infections. Good. Okay, then hand hygiene obviously <coughs> important, other infection control, um, your IV cannulas, and urinary catheters. You know, is it still needed? Can we take it out? The sooner we take it out, the less risk we have of getting an infection. Okay. So now we're going to look at the standard approach when we are looking at the patient level. Okay. So this is probably the most important part of antimicrobials that we are going to do. Because there are four things that you are going to be asking yourself. And I know in the hospital you are not prescribing, but one day when you are a CMP in the primary health, you are going to have to go through these things because you will be prescribed. So the first major question is, does the patient need an antimicrobial? If yes, which one? How are we going to choose which one is the most appropriate? Then after we've written it into an appropriate and administration of the antimicrobial, and the last one is review the need for the antimicrobial, which is linked to the duration of treatment. Okay. So, the principles of rational antimicrobial prescribing is in this seven steps. The first thing you have to ask yourself is, do we need an antibiotic? If the patient needs an antibiotic, you have to take the cultures before you administer your first dose of antibiotic. Why do you think you need to take it before the first dose? What is the antibiotic going to do to your culture? It's going to influence the outcome, yes. Some antibiotics start working very quickly. So if you only take the culture after an hour after you've administered the antibiotic, the antibiotic is already going to start killing some of your culture. So your culture isn't going to be very accurate. So always make sure that your culture is taken before you administer, if you can. Like, for example, meningitis is like a medical emergency. So in those cases, you're just going to give the ceftriaxone. But you're going to try to take your culture then as quick as possible, or you're going to note when the ceftriaxone was given so that you can account for that when you see your, your LP results. Okay. Um, then you're going to choose an appropriate empiric antibiotic. Please take note of the word empiric. We'll talk about it a little bit later. The correct dose and route of administration. So when the patient is vomiting, we want to give the route of administration. IV, yes, because you want to make sure your antibiotics is in there. You want to start antibiotic treatment rapidly in serious infection. This is where the hang time comes in. If your patient is seriously ill, you have to administer it as fast as possible. Practice early and effective source control. Okay. So these are all your um, preventative measures. 
and then evaluate the appropriateness of treatment every day. So usually with an antibiotic, you have, the patient has to start improving at least 24 to 48 hours after you start your first antibiotic. You must see an improvement. If you do not see an improvement after 48 hours, then your antibiotic treatment isn't working. Okay. So the monitoring is very important. So who of you have seen a prescription chart like this before in your hospital? Yes, oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> so you know how to fill this in, don't you? Not yet. Okay, so patient label, easy. Weight, easy. Allergies, easy. Okay? Then you have to do the diagnosis. So what is this patient's problem? Is it pneumonia? Is it a UTI? Is it meningitis? What is it? Okay? Then you have to say what you think the source of the infection is. Is it a hospital acquired infection? Or is it a community acquired infection? Why is this important? Are you going to use the same antibiotic for hospital and community acquired? No. no, not at all. The indication is it prophylactic, empirical, or definitive? We'll talk about that one. Has the cultures been sent? So, this form is really nice for the pharmacist because then the pharmacist can know what is wrong and they can really assess if the right treatment is being given. Okay. Question. Yes. I wanted to ask, um, if um, the antibiotic, if you administer an antibiotic now and after 48 hours it doesn't work, it means that you need to change to another antibiotic? Doesn't well, it could mean many things. It could mean it's it's, a, it's the wrong antibiotic. It could mean you're, think, you're treating a viral infection instead of a bacterial infection. It could mean um, the bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic. So it could mean many things. <coughs> and then usually you want your culture results. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Shouldn't like, the cultures be done before yes, the before, Because it will cause that super infection. Mm -hmm. But you won't wait for the culture results before you start the antibiotic. Because you want to start the antibiotic as soon as possible. Then when your culture results come back, the first thing that you're going to do is change. You see, now that's the other thing when you're taking someone's history. Recurrent use of antibiotics is one of the things that you have to ask them because you cannot use the same antibiotic that they've used within the previous three months because you have to assume that they are resistant to that antibiotic. So, yes, good question. Any other questions? So, when is an antibiotic indicated? The rule of thumb is you want to look for a systemic type of infection. Okay. So are there fever? Are there any leukocytosis? Or if you do a white blood cell count, is the white cell count increased? Are there any inflammatory markers that are raised? Okay, what's your inflammatory markers that you usually look at? For systemic inflammation? CRP? Yes. Okay, so CRP is a good inflammatory marker. And then you're looking at the specific organ dysfunction. So say you think it is a urinary tract infection, you will test urine and you will do a urine test. Okay? To detect for nitrite and things like that. Okay. You can also use your vitals. Okay? You probably triage patients before. Yeah. So your leukocytosis and inflammatory markers that you can use is your white cell count. Usually, an infection is increased. You 
your erythrocyte sedimentation rate in an infection is usually increased. Your platelets are usually decreased and your CRP is usually increased, more than 10. Okay? So remember, an antibiotic is indicated, but it could not be a bacterial infection. There, there are many viruses that can cause, there's a viral type of pneumonia, there's a viral type of <coughs> <coughs> so, for antibiotic indications, you can prescribe an antibiotic prophylactically to prevent an infection. Okay, so these are the things on the prescription chart. There's a prophylactic, an empirical, and definitive treatment. So, prophylactic treatment is when you are preventing. Who knows? What type of things do we use to prevent infections? Do we ever use antibiotics to prevent an infection? Where in the hospital? Sorry? Yes, in orthopedics. Yeah. Okay. Usually before surgery. Yeah. Prevention. Good. Risk of infection, <coughs> primary health care, preventative, mm -hmm. in the trauma ward, okay, for example. It's like uh, if somebody comes in with a dog bite, mm -hmm. okay, yes, so that is a good example. Anybody worked in TB? Okay. So some patients get mice get isolated preventative therapy, especially for our HIV positive patients. Okay. So that is prevention. Cotramoxazole also used to prevent diarrhea and pneumonia. Um, for patients with those who are compromised. Empiric treatment. Remember I spoke to you about the word empiric. So empiric treatment is when you treat for the most likely infective organism. So you are in step two now. You have already established that an antibiotic is indicated. You can see the systemic infection signs there. You can see the tonsils. There must be something. There's perian discharge. So you know that there, there is an infection and like 95% of the time it is going to be bacterial. Now, you didn't take the culture yet, but you have to start your antibiotics. You can't wait 48 hours before you start your antibiotics. So you didn't do a culture. And in many cases in primary health care, you're not really going to do a culture anyway. So how do you decide what to treat with if you don't have a culture? You treat for the most likely infective organism. So... With a throat infection, what is the most likely infective organism? Streptococcus. So streptococcus, gram positive bacteria, we match the antibiotic spectrum of activity. Okay, so what type of antibiotic will we normally use for a streptococcal throat infection? <laughs> One that covers gram positive, which is our penicillin. Yes. Okay. So empiric treatment is the treatment to treat the most likely infective organisms. How do we know which is the most <laughs> likely ones? Each infection, like your UTIs, most of them are caused by E. coli. 
So E. coli gram negative. So you want to get you want to get an antibody antibiotic that covers gram negative. Nitrofurin, toin, phosphomycin. We used to use ciprofloxacin. Now we want to use something with less side effects. Okay? That's what empiric means. So the last one, definitive treatment, is when we have the culture, and the culture shows that the bacteria that's causing this infection is sensitive to this antibiotic. Okay. So then we know we are treating with the right antibiotic and the bacteria is sensitive. But we won't always have a culture. And that's why empiric treatment and knowing what the empiric treatment is is so important. Okay. So there is some examples of prophylactic treatment. So when we're looking at empiric treatment and how we know which one is which and which one to use, there are two things that we're going to look at. The one is the source of infection and the other one is the site of infection. Okay. So the site talks about the most likely microorganism that usually lives in the ear or usually lives in the lungs or things like that. So the source of infection can either be a community acquired infection or a hospital acquired infection. Okay. So if we first look at the community acquired infection, usually the patient will come in and they wouldn't have been for hospital in the hospital before they came. So then we can be pretty sure that they got the pneumonia in the community. Okay. For a hospital acquired infection, the patient was usually in the hospital for 48 hours. So any new infection that happens in the hospital and the patient was already hospitalized for 48 hours, we assume that it is a hospital acquired infection. Okay. So the type of antibiotic that you're going to use, that you're going to use for a community acquired infection and a hospital acquired infection is going to be different. Your empiric treatment. So usually for a community acquired uncomplicated pneumonia, you are going to use either amoxicillin or coamoxiclav or whatever. For a hospital acquired or a ventilator associated <coughs> pneumonia, you are probably going to use papyricillin tazobactam with an aminoglycoside. Okay, because the type of organisms that you will get from the community and the type of organisms that you're going to get from a ventilator acquired pneumonia or a hospital acquired pneumonia is going to be different. So you're usually going to use second or third line antibiotics for a, a hospital acquired infection and first line antibiotics for a community acquired infection. Now as the question that has been asked, if it is a recurrent infection, the definition of a recurrent infection is usually within three months. So if someone gets a UTI every two months. It means it is a recurrent infection. Um, and then it becomes difficult because now you are treating with an antibiotic. So say your first line treatment for the UTI was nitrofurin toy. Now the patient shows up after two months with another with a, a new UTI. Now you don't know, is the nitrofurotone going to work or is, are they not going to work? So in the case of recurrent infections, we must preferably do a culture. Because we are not sure if it's going to work or not. So that is the time in primary health care where you are actually going to do a culture in terms of recurrent infections. 
because then you want to know is there any resistance to this antibiotic. So your medicine history becomes very important. Okay, so the source of infection in the community, we are usually expecting non-resistant organisms. We use first-line antibiotics with less side effects. In the hospital, we are going to expect mutated and resistant organisms. We're going to use second-line antibiotics with more side effects. That's why there are second-line antibiotics. Okay, so the side effects usually goes with the first and second line. Okay, then the site of infection, so which part of the body is infected with the peripheral line sepsis, it's usually the skin or soft tissue. The most likely pathogens on the skin is your staphylococcus. In the hospital, it might be a methicillin resistant staphylococcus. Okay or a yet type of microorganism and you basically treat for the usual suspects with empiric treatment. So remember your skin or a soft tissue infection is usually caused by staphylococcus which is gram positive. Then your upper part of your body is usually caused by gram positive and the lower part of your intestines and organs and UTIs and stuff is usually a gram negative. Okay. So with empiric treatment, you know where do they get it, what part of the body is infected, and that will be the choice that you are making. Okay. So there, you will look what is the most likely organism, is gram positive or negative, is anaerobes, and then you choose your antibiotic based on the spectrum that they are covering. Okay? Another thing that we have to talk about when we're talking about the site of infection is that not all antibiotic penetrates all parts of the body equally well. Okay? So, especially with your soft tissue and bone infections, not all antibiotics will go into bones very well. Okay, so it's especially important to know which antibiotics is good for your soft tissue infections, for example, your cloxacillin, your clindamycin, good for soft tissue and bone infections. Um, you can see the usually penicillins don't cross the blood-brain barrier unless you've got some type of meningitis. Um, Menoglycosides, uh, you can see they penetrate poorly into lung tissue, fairly into soft tissue. which antibiotic to use because you will have your culture and you will see what is going on so you know where cultures come from if it's a UTI, we usually take urine if we're wanting to get <coughs> sepsis we usually take blood okay so the microbial culture is about growing the microbe so we're swabbing the throat we're putting the stuff from the swab on a plate like that and we put it in an incubator where it can sit and grow nicely. The other thing that they also do if you're doing a culture and sensitivity is they will put little discs inside of those, inside of these plates. And the little disc they will put in an antibiotic solution. So you will see that there are zones where the microbes don't grow. So the microbes grow here where it's fuzzy, or the, the culture grows where it's fuzzy. <coughs> 
So you can see if I'm correct, this antibiotic, this, it's resistant because it's growing everywhere. This one is working. So most of these antibiotics, the, the culture is sensitive to it, so you can use those, those antibiotics. This one, it's resistant because it's not stopping the growth. And that's how they know if a culture is sensitive or resistant to a, a microbe. Okay? So they look at the zone of growth inhibition. They see sometimes you will see bigger and smaller zones. So the smaller zones are the antibiotics that are not so good at stopping the growth. The bigger zones are the more potent antibiotics. Okay? So this is what the NCS report looks like. Go and search in your patient files. Usually the case is more sensitive, so for this patient it's lucky. You can use many different types of antibiotics that are sensitive. Now how do you choose which one to use? If the culture comes back and there are many different antibiotics that you can choose from. The first line ones, yes. So you want to choose the one with the least side effects, which is usually the one with the narrowest spectrum of activity. So say you started your patient on coamoxiclav, which is a broad spectrum. But then the culture comes back, and you can see that they are even sensitive to amoxyl. So then you want to change from the co-amoxiclav to the amoxyl because it's not necessary to put the patient through all those extra side effects. So when you get your culture back, you usually want to change to the narrowest spectrum that the, the bacteria is sensitive to. Does that make sense? Um, route of administration, that's just an example, and the recommended duration of treatment. So the recommended duration of treatment <coughs> for a normal antibiotic cycle for penicillins, it's usually five days. Azithromycin, usually three days, but you're, generally they say that five to seven days, usually they will not use seven days anymore. So five days is, a, is the, probably the most frequently used one. 10 to 14 days isn't, is only used for specific type of infections like sinusitis or a more serious type of infection. And then in meningitis you, you can get longer durations. Um, and then if you have a bone infection, you will probably be on antibiotics for a longer time. Okay. But your run of the mill is usually three to five days duration. Okay. So that is the principles of rational antibiotic prescribing. And this is an example <coughs> of just a completed... So these days we won't use the profloxacin anymore. Okay. So your choice of empiric agent, you want to cover as many microorganisms, but you want to keep it narrow so that you don't select out resistance. <coughs> so it is a balance when you are selecting your empiric agent. We have decided which antibiotic to give. We have our empiric thing. So there's the four D's then of antibiotic prescribery. Um, antibiotic prescribing, which is delivery, review indications for the IV daily, and always aim for oral. Remember, if you have a choice between IV and oral, 
It's better to give oral because it minimizes the patient chance of a peripheral line infection. The dose must be correct, the duration. Most infections do not require more than seven days. And then de-escalation, when you get your culture back, you want to put the patient on the narrowest spectrum of antibiotics that will be effective for them. Okay. So you can read more about those things. Just, yes. can work through some of the case studies when we start next week's lecture. Just to try and bring together the antibiotic knowledge and the practical knowledge that we need. 